The Diamond Speech Competition has been running here at Sidcote for over 100 years and forms one of the high points in our summer festival programme. It dates back to a former headmaster who has an interesting and quite colourful uh, story attached to him. Uh, Henry Diamond was a student in uh, the first few years that Sidcote was established on its present site, and he was a student from 1810 to 1815. He then stayed on as what was called an, an indentured teacher, and this was a seven-year apprenticeship. Um, so he didn't go to university, he stayed on at the school he was educated at uh, and worked uh, to become a teacher through training. And during that time, he fell in love with another member of staff. And the school at the time was one of the first schools to be co-educational. So it had a boy's side to it and a girl's side to it. And Henry fell in love with one of the matrons from the girl's side of the school, much to the consternation uh, of the governing body. So Henry was given the choice by the chair of the Board of Governors either to stop his relationship or to leave the school. The two of them left Sidcot, got married, and then returned some time later, where he was the headmaster and his wife supported him in his role. And one of the things that Henry was really uh, noted for in his time as headmaster was his power of oratory. Uh, his voice was described as being mellifluous, and he was very powerful in the way that he was able to, to speak, and when he spoke, people listened, and listened intently. And that's why the Diamond Speech Competition is so important to us here today, because it speaks very much to the Quaker values that the school was founded on, that of speaking truth to power. And Henry is a very good example of this, and our young people today, when they enter the Diamond Speech Competition, are doing exactly the things that he did all those years ago. The competition itself is very open. Uh, our young people have to uh, present a speech that they've written themselves for 10 minutes, and it can be on any subject that is important to them. And as a result, the subjects that they choose are very various. Some can be very uh, appropriate for the times we live in, some can be very entertaining, some can be deeply personal. But all of them have this sense of passion and engagement that young people really believe in what they're saying, have a voice and use that to communicate their thoughts in a very powerful and a very impressive way. Good evening. The first of our speakers is James. James is a Year 13 student who's been at SIGCOP for the last five years. He studied maths, physics and history for A-levels and he was also the head boy for this academic year. James has always been interested in social and political issues and has performed in the Diamond Speech once before, two years ago. He wants to give the audience a concept that they can take away and apply to their lives outside of the speeches, regardless of who they are, and hopes that everyone can fully connect to his speech. Let me introduce James Barber with his speech, Off the Hook. What if I were to tell you that in almost every house in the entire Western world, a disease was festering. This disease has destroyed countless lives, brought whole communities to ruin, and many still live with its consequences today. And yet, we have categorically and broadly ignored its existence and left its sufferers not only untreated, but actively persecuted for their disability. This disease, however, is not spread by a virus or by bacteria. This disease is the alleged disease of addiction. Since 2020 and the start of the coronavirus pandemic, over 8 million people in the UK alone have been put on the high risk of addiction register. There's been a 20% increase in opioid addiction cases. Drug-related deaths are at an all-time high, both in Britain and across the entire Western world. The question I pose to you today is how can we stop this second 
far more debilitating pandemic from sweeping across our nation and destroying more lives than even COVID has so far. But let's start with what I thought I knew about addiction. Imagine if I took a section of this audience and sent you off to take heroin every day for 20 days. What do you think would happen? We think that due to chemical hooks within the drugs themselves, you would become dependent. You would physically need those drugs. And at the end of the 20 days, you would all be addicted. However, something here is not quite right. Imagine, if you will, that you leave your house after my speech, step out and get hit by a car. You'll be taken to hospital and given diamorphine to soothe the pain. Diamorphine chemically is heroin. In fact, it's much higher quality than most street heroin and you'll be given it in large quantities for quite a long period of time. If the story of addiction by chemical hook is correct, what should happen? They should, you should, leave hospital addicted to heroin. But it doesn't happen. Grandma doesn't leave the hospital from after her hip replacement, an avid junkie. Moreover, we even have a human experiment that tested and confirmed this hypothesis. It was called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, almost 20% of US soldiers were regularly using heroin. There was shock and horror in the newspapers. How will we ever deal with this wave of junkies that will flood our streets after the war? And what actually happened, I hear you ask? Well, they didn't go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped. They most weren't even diagnosed as addicts. Now, if you believe in the chemical hooks story, then this makes little sense. But Professor Bruce Alexander had a different idea. He said, what if addiction wasn't about your chemical hooks? What if addiction was about your situation. In Portugal, in the year 2000, they recognised this. By that point, almost 1% of Portuguese people were addicted to opioids. That is one in a hundred. And every year, they increase the severity of the traditional anti-drugs punishment more. Harsher punishments, longer prison sentences, more shaming, and the problem only got worse. Then, the government turned to a large panel of doctors and academics and asked, how do we actually solve this? The answer they got back, surprisingly, was decriminalise every drug, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is crucial, reinvest all the money we spent in ostracising addicts in reconnecting them with society. And so they didn't do prison. They did psychological therapy. They gave microloans for addicts to begin their own businesses. And most crucially, they began a massive job creation scheme, paying half the wages of addicts when a business employed them. Their goal was to make sure that every addict in Portugal had something to get out of bed for in the morning. Well, it's been almost 21 years since that policy began and the results are flooding in. Addiction in Portugal is down by 50%. That's five, zero percent. Overdosing, down. HIV infections, also down. The Portuguese found out that addicts will return to the fold when their community is more engaging than their next fix. I think that as a society, we are addicted to punishing addicts. It feels great. And our addictions are only causing more harm. 
what I've tried to do with the addicts I know is show them that I respect and trust them regardless of whether they're using or not. And I never want them to feel alone or to be alone. And I know this process works because it worked for me. That's right, I was an addict. For me, it wasn't drugs, it was technology, gaming, social media. I would waste up to 10 hours a day at its worst online. And I just couldn't keep my eyes off the screen. I was addicted because I didn't have many connections and I really didn't have any reason to want to be present in my everyday life. Then, with the impetus and support of those around me, I chose to engage and it changed my life for the better. I moved to a different school, here actually, where I found more friends, more colleagues, more peers, and slowly I replaced my crippling technology addiction with far more healthy, tangible, real relationships. I believe we live in a culture where we are increasingly susceptible to addiction, especially with the stress and isolation of the COVID pandemic. It's really weird to say, but in the most connected society ever, disconnection, the major driver of addiction, is growing. The number of people the average person would call a close friend has been declining constantly since the 1950s. Whilst the average amount of floor space in the average house has only been increasing. Our lives, on average, are getting emptier and lonelier than ever before. We traded friends for floor space and the results have been catastrophic. I think it's about time that we purge ourselves of our vindictive addiction to demonising addicts. For years, we've been chanting war songs at them. I think it's about time to start singing love songs to them. And let our new song's title be, You're Not Alone, We're With You. Because the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Do you believe that nowadays social and political extremism are consequences or products of addiction? Well, I don't believe that social and political extremism are as much consequences of addiction as they are symptoms of addiction. If you look at uh, ideological extremism, religious extremism, social extremism, all of these are incredibly temporary, pseudo-relational, um, kind of pseudo connections that people build with each other to try to form a kind of malformed community. And I believe that they are more symptomatic of a lack of credible, reliable, um, truthful institutions in our society than they are of addiction itself. I think our addiction to that extremism needs to be and will be rectified by the reinstitution of good civic virtue. If you were lucky enough to be able to speak to Priti Patel for a minute at the Home Office about her ideas on prison, what would you say to her? Well, I would say to her that I believe that the crux, well, the crux of my speech certainly, is that connections are found within real, tangible community. I think the only way that we can deal with our increasing epidemic of addiction is by reinstituting the local community as a major feature in people's life, whether that be the town hall meeting, the yearly village party, the clubs, the youth clubs, the sports clubs, any sort of institution run by the community for the community breeds real social connections which can be used to combat and destroy addiction utterly. In the inner cities, those connections have been, and those institutions have been largely lost. I believe that's why we see inner cities especially suffering from drug addictions. 
So I think I tell her to start reinstituting the locality rather than the macro, the, the macro kind of country. Our next speaker is Maddie Didow. Maddie joined SIGCOT last year in year 10, and she quickly established herself as a talented actress, taking the lead in the memorable production of The Addams Family. Maddie enjoys debate, languages, and literature. She also has just returned from an intrepid sail with the Challenge Wales tour ships, and hopes to continue to build on this amazing experience. This summer, Maddie will continue to challenge herself by joining SIGCOT's theatre company in performances at Valley Fest. Let me introduce Maddie Didow with her speech, Snitches Get Stitches. I love to gossip, and I'm not alone in this. But not many people would openly admit this for fear of being known as spiteful or malicious or a cow. But what is gossip? And why do we hate it so much? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines gossip as casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not yet confirmed to be true. And for the intellectuals among us, the Urban Dictionary defines gossip as something that nasty people do when they are bored, have no life, or are really stupid. <laughs> well, that doesn't make me look great. But who said that gossip was negative or false? Social scientists simply define gossip as two people talking about a third absent person, which is a lot more neutral and oftentimes just describes a regular conversation. So why do we as humans talk about each other so much? In attempting to answer this question, I would like to say that my talk is not about trolling or fake news or celebrity culture. I simply would just like to save the word gossip from its negative implications. Humans are social animals who prehistorically bonded by grooming each other, by removing insects from each other's fur or combing each other.
But at some point, we transition to using language. Anthropologist Robin Dunbar poses the theory that when our circle social circles were smaller, around a maximum of 80 people, grooming was sufficient bonding. But as our contacts grew, we needed to find new ways to be close to an one another. So talking evolved to keep us together and gossip evolved to keep us safe. You see, in the words of Sir Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. Well, he actually would have said scientia potentiast, but the point still stands. Gossip spread valuable information and led to cultural learning. To be socially successful, we needed to know what people were doing, who we could trust and who we couldn't. This explains why we are generally more interested in the lives of people in our social sphere of a similar age and gender, because they are our natural competition for food, resources and partners. And those who were simply not interested had no advantage, rendering co gossip as a key social skill. This all sounds quite positive, so something must have changed for gossip to go from being a social advantage to the slander we know and hate today. The word gossip comes from the Old English word godsib, which referred to the woman at present at the birth of a child and came to mean close female friends. But in the 16th century, attitudes towards women started to deteriorate and obedience was valued above all else and failure to abide by this had serious con consequences, namely being forced to wear an iron muzzle designed to humiliate and stop the wearer from talking which was curiously known as a gossip's bridle. If this wasn't clear enough, a law was passed in 1547 which banned women from meeting to talk and babble. Because, once again, knowledge is power, and these women were becoming socially powerful, and a lot of socially powerful women in the 16th century just happened to be accused of witchcraft. And while on trial, these witches would be encouraged or tortured into snitching on their friends, their sisters, their mothers and daughters, which changed the connotations of gossip from friendship and affection to denigration and betrayal. But that was the 16th century. What about now? In today's society, as a generalization, we hate gossips. But I'd argue that we actually hate bad gossips there's a difference. You see, good gossip is still a social skill and still between close friends. It involves trust and is a warning to people that you care about of previous bad behavior and a deterrent against future bad behavior. But bad gossip is reckless and selfish. You see, if I were to gossip to one person and they told one person and so on, in a week, eight people would know about whatever we were talking about. But if I told two people, who told two people, and so on and so forth, by the end of the month, a billion people would know about what we were talking about. That is, assuming that, of course, everybody knows two different people and that a billion of people care that Karen next door is skiving off work. However, I should add that in the age of social media, these widespread rumours are far more plausible than ever, highlighting the dangers of bad gossip. Furthermore, when the universities of Texas and Oklahoma observed the gossip in offices, they found that while women gossip more than men, more of their gossip was mutual at around 75%, and that men and women equally gossiped negatively, although 3-4% to of gossip is malicious. And even this causes bonding, with negative gossip causing stronger bonds than positive, according to Dutch researchers who also found that Gossiping positively about others inspires self-improvement and talking negatively about someone makes you feel better about yourself and helps you learn from others' mistakes. So I ask you again, why do we hate gossip so much? As far as I can see, gossiping is a helpful evolutionary skill that still strengthens social bonds and keeps us safe. The poor word gossip has a very bad reputation and I'd like to think that I have given you an alternative view to its meaning. So go forth and gossip. So long as you are honest and kind, what is the harm? At least, that's just what I've heard. In the 16th century, um, gossip was seen as bad because it gave women power. Do you think there's still an element of that today, and is that still part of the reason why people don't like gossip? 
Um, I do believe that gossip and feminism are inherently linked because women started to gossip because they couldn't talk to the higher up powers, so they had to talk among themselves. But I do think today the viewing of gossip being only a female activity is still harmful because I think, though I said I wouldn't really touch on celebrity culture, lots of the negativity around that is directed at women, but it's written in tabloids and news columns, which is not a female dominated area. So I do believe that it is a lot more even now. So I don't think it is just um, a feminist issue, but I think the demonization is. We all know that gossiping is seen as inherently bad from a misogynistic point of view. And when men do it, it's seen as um, locker chat or lad talk. So do you think gossiping would be the right word to describe that, or is there another word used for when men do it? Um, I 100% believe that this is still gossip, um, especially from a social science perspective, that where that is the definition of gossip. But I think, like many other things, like being bossy and assertive, when it comes from women, the gossip is demonised. But when it's men, it's just passed off as boys being boys. So I do think it's just exactly the same, but it's talked about less. Thank you.
Our third speaker is Oliver Painter. Ollie is in Year 11, having joined Sidcot in Year 7. He loves the arts and is one sixth of Sidcot's sketch group, Hotbag. Ollie is also a keen musician, playing both piano and guitar, and he is currently working on his grade 8 singing, which he will take next academic year. When not at school, Ollie can usually be found playing music or acting with both amateur and professional companies, or writing plays or other prose. Ollie has been keen to take part in the Diamond Speech for some years now, so is delighted to be a part of this year's competition. Let me introduce Oliver Painter with his speech, Taming, Training and Testing. Since the modern education system was first established in the Victorian era, teachers have always been taught to deliver information to children who must conform to rules and pass exams. In short, children are trained, tamed, and tested. Certainly, there have been some changes over the years. Uh, comprehensive schools were introduced in 1965, and in 1988, we moved from O-levels to GCSEs. However, the essence of what is taught and how learning is evaluated has remained largely unchanged. This exam-based system that we have is designed to test how clever a child is, which is determined only by their ability to remember facts and pass exams. Even if you do well at school and come away with three A stars at A levels, moving on to some prestigious Russell Group University, is that enough? Has the system worked? Has the system uh, produced these apparently clever children as good communicators or with the skills to work collaboratively with colleagues? Can they get through a workload without an all-day timetable or a teacher next to them spoon-feeding them facts? Can they recognise a fraudster online? Do they understand how to analyse the news they're ingesting from the internet so they're not manipulated? In short, are they ready for life? <laughs> More seriously though, there is a, a large cohort of children who don't get these top grades, or any grades in fact. In 2019, 100,000 of British children came away with not five GCSE passes. you would not be surprised to hear that th the future employment prospects and life chances for these children are bleak. <laughs> 50 years ago, those less successful in exams would work in shops or, or in farms or in factories. Now, Amazon is killing the retail industry, farms are mechanised, and the number of manufacturing jobs in the UK has fallen from 8.7 million in 1952 to 2.7 million today. Yeah, and on top of this, job security is a thing of the past. The 1970s employer had yet to dream up the zero-hour contract. So all this got me thinking. Since the world of work has changed so drastically since the fundamentals of our education system were established, is a system designed to meet the needs of a society going through the Industrial Revolution really still relevant to today? Surely the very nature of our schools needs a radical rethink. Now, an example of this radical rethink has to be a school called Agora in the Netherlands. Now, the idea behind Agora is that it is a school without rules. Cue a sharp intake of breath for any teachers listening. I concede that that concept would fill many a teacher, parent, or even some students with horror. Of course, there were some behaviour rules like no smoking or no stabbing or whatever, I don't know. But, but it's labelled a school with no rules because they don't have a timetable. They don't really have lessons or a syllabus or subjects. The whole idea behind their students' education is that they are treated as independent thinkers who, who self-direct their learning and only ask for guidance and help after 
having looked for the answers themselves. I'll give you an example of what I mean. One student said, I want to build a skateboard. And so they said, OK, do it. But, of course, to build it, the student had to learn some DT, some woodwork. They also had to learn physics to make it aerodynamic and learn about the bearings of wheels. She had to learn how to calculate the different dimensions of the separate parts. That's maths. Even a bit of art for decoration. So why do I think this concept is so interesting? Well, this student wasn't learning abstract concepts taught in, in separate subject lessons to write down on an exam paper. She was learning how facts have practical and useful applications in the real world. I mean, the phrase commonly uttered by the school child, why am I ever going to need to know this, is not one you hear from an Agora student. And after this practical and relatable experience, she'd come away with a whole load of valuable things. Firstly, she'd got a lot of academic knowledge in a variety of subject areas. Secondly, she'd grown confidence in her own ability. And thirdly, she'd got a skateboard. <laughs> now, the lack of formal lesson structure isn't the only thing that's different at Agora. They don't have sets or year groups. So no one's seen as in the clever group, no one's seen as a weaker student. It's another radical idea, but it's Agora's view that students should be grouped by maturity, not calendar age. Anyone that's spent time with teenagers will all agree that children do not develop at the same rate due to their age. Surely that should be taken into account, no? Maybe we shouldn't keep slavishly grouping children together based on when they were born. So clearly, Agora is, is a very radical idea and a far cry from the British curriculum and teaching style. However, I don't think that means we should just pass it out of hand and stick with what we've got, as I'm not sure what we've got is as good as it can be. Now, of course, I've got my student-centric view, but in preparing for this speech, I talked to many professionals from, from public and state education sectors, as well as people from industry, about their, their thoughts on our education system and on the Agora-style model. Now, many dismissed Agora as trendy and unworkable. Some found it intriguing, and, uh, and some were, quite frankly, horrified at the thought of giving children that level of autonomy near power tools. However, they all agreed on one thing. All teachers agree that structure is useful. Structure creates routine, and routine is essential to later life. In short, I couldn't find a single person who was wholly in favour of the Agora model. However, when I talked to university professors and employers about the same subject, they saw things slightly differently. They look for people who can think for themselves, show initiative, and problem solve. And they saw a lot of positives in the Agora model. Universities look for critical thinkers, and employers look for people who can ask the right questions after having thought for themselves. Now, when I researched the number one requested generic skill on internet job boards, number one requested skill was initiative. Now, I have to confess to being slightly disappointed. Uh, after just slogging my way through GCSE Eng English literature, I was very upset not to find no one was looking for someone that could offer them five good quotes on the theme of ambition in Macbeth. <laughs> but there you have it, initiative it is, apparently. Fortunately, for the children of the Netherlands, initiative is a skill at the heart of Agora. However, I don't think the British system prioritises this nearly enough. So think about it. From the age of four, we're told what to do and where to go every second of the school day. And then, age 18, we're, we're released to universities and employers and told, go. How are students supposed to be equipped to think for themselves if they've been entrapped for 14 years in this rigid regime of rules? So though it is a radical idea, maybe teaching students random facts and separate lessons just to memorise and write down on an exam paper has had its day. Perhaps teaching students this, this self-directed learning maybe, potentially, would teach them to, to be independent thinkers 
and have initiative and, and solve problems and potentially go into the wide world having experienced some of these qualities and to be able to ask the right questions. Because this isn't just about the job market either. Th these are vital skills for life outside the workplace. In the 2016 US election, 126 million Americans read Russian propaganda uploaded to Facebook. And then they elected the man that the Kremlin wanted in the White House. And in a world of fake news where a small number of Silicon Valley tech billionaires are increasingly able to control what young people read. Shouldn't education be about producing students who can ask questions, not just answer them? Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic and the last two years of OSL and a shift in assessment to overall class performance has offered an opportunity for change? And if so, how do you think we can take that opportunity? Now, I didn't have enough time to discuss the impact of COVID on education, but a direct quote from my first draft, actually, of this speech was after months of staying at home with nothing to do but FaceTime teachers and play pranks on neighbours. We have finally got back into the classroom and nothing's changed. Um, and I think that's quite relevant to the question that, that you know, th the, the COVID pandemic almost forced educators almost overnight to rethink the way they taught students. So we were learning over a screen. I was sat in my own chair learning my GCSE syllabus for, for hours on end, and yet we still got the lessons across. And I think that, yes, the social impact of not being with my friends did affect me. And I think I learn a lot less online than I do in the classroom. And I think the reason is because I'm, I'm a very practical learner. And I think at the heart of Agora, which is what I'm talking about, their thing is practical learning. And I think especially with l young minds, to learn practically uh, is, a, is a much better motivation than to read a textbook. Um, so I think if we were to take what we had to result to in OSL and why people uh, didn't react as well to learning as they do in the classroom, I think if we took that and saw it as, okay, well, what's the difference? Then we could realise that the, the, the importance of practical learning in the classroom and hopefully uh, reintroduce more practical learning uh, on a more regular basis. Thank you, Ollie. I, I enjoyed your um, innovative views on education, but how would you marry those against the um, integrity of qualifications that employers demand? I'm not suggesting that we completely throw the baby out with the bathwater with our current system. Y there are plenty of things that our system does to prepare children for the national exams, which is what the system has decided is the way to test ability and get qualifications. I'm not suggesting we completely throw that out. That's a conversation for another time, and perhaps the system needs to change so that ability is less tested on how they do academically in exams and more on life skills. You know, the IB brings in the theory of knowledge, um, which is, a, uh, which is a, an interesting way to, to test uh, ability in children that isn't necessarily academic. But I think it's all about finding that balance if you completely prioritise academics, OK, they'll do well in those exams that are needed for the qualifications. However, they won't know what to do with those opportunities when they get them because they haven't developed life skills. If you go the other side of the scale and go all life skills and put you know, academics aside and then they fail at their, at their national exams, then they won't have the qualifications and won't have the opportunities. So it's all about finding that balance between being able to get those qualifications to pass those exams that are in place, and perhaps that needs to be changed, but once again, conversation for another time. But they need to get those qualifications, but also integrate those life skills on top of that. And I think the balance is key to creating well-rounded individuals from education.
Now, when you choose a law career, the moment you embark, there is this joke you're bound to hear, a lawyer is a shark. Ignore that. It's simplistic, and it's dumb. Only some of you will turn out sharks. Just some. The rest are chum. Our topic is blood in the water. Kids, it's time me a feast. Law school is a waste. Oh yes, unless you acquire a taste for blood in the water. Dark and red and raw, you're nothing until the thrill of the kill becomes your only law. Mr. Schultz, hypothetical question. Would you be willing to defend the following banker accused of fraud? A kind old grandma took her savings and she sent it. Off to your client, all she saved since she was here. Well, he promised to invest it, but he spent it. On gambling and heroin and beer. No, I would not want to take that case. Wrong! This one is a win unless you're lazy. Grandma's broke, she'll have some heck from legal aid. Put her on the stand and call her old and crazy. Yet guy goes free and he can get you high and made. Look for the blood in the water. Read your Thomas Hobbes. Only spineless snobs will quarrel with the morally dubious jobs. Yes, blood in the water. Your scruples are a flaw, miss. Oops, hypothetical question. Would you be the right lawyer for the following client? Say they offer you a bundle for defending. A famous hitman for the mafia elite. Seems he missed his chosen prey, killed a nun, and drove away, running over three cute puppies in the street. What, you think I wouldn't defend him just because he's a typical man? <laughs> oh, you gals think you're so tough. A but Oh dear, I fear my comment has offended. Hard to argue though when you're too mad to speak. Your employment will be very quickly ended when they see how your emotions make you weak. So what's my point? I run a billion dollar law firm and I hire four new interns every year. From this class I will select four young sharks whom I respect and those four will have a guaranteed career. Do you follow me? So I want to see what? Blood in the water. Exactly. Let the games begin. Four of you will win. But just those four with the dorsal fin. Yes, blood in the water. So fight and scratch and glow. Yes, Miss uh... Woods, L. Woods. Someone's had their morning coffee. Would you summarize the case of State of Indiana versus Hearn in your reading? Oh, I wanted to answer the puppy question. But I'm asking you about the assigned reading. Okay, who assigns a reading for the first day of class? <laughs> you have guts, Miss Woods. Miss Kensington? Let's say you teach a class at Harvard Law School, a position that you're justly proud about. But a girl on whom you call hasn't read the case at all. Should you let it go, or...? No, I'd throw her out. All right, then. You heard your classmate. You have just been killed. She cut your throat, so grab your coat. Yes, you've got guts, but now they're spilled. Your blood in the water. So would you please withdraw? Be ready to learn, or is it unfair? Or wait, I don't care, that's just how I rule In life against flu, with fear and shock and go You're nothing until The thrill of the kill Becomes your own is Verity Mann. Verity is a year 13 student who has been at SIGCOP for nine years. 
She has just finished studying English literature, Spanish, and drama A-levels. Verity says, as an actor, English student, and person who just talks a lot in general, the opportunity to participate in the Diamond Speech has always been exciting to me. Having grown up watching the competition every year, I feel proud to be in the shoes of the Diamond Speech finalists who I looked up to when I was younger, as well as being the latest in a long line of Quaker elders to take part. Verity's speech hopes to incorporate her love of literature, politics, and talking about things which she finds interesting to explore the undercurrent in all our lives, which is storytelling. Let me introduce Verity Mann with her speech from Tolstoy to Teletubbies. The idea for this speech sprang from a conversation with my mother about Tolstoy. It's niche, I know, but bear with me. She was telling me about Tolstoy's short story, The Kreutzer Sonata, which is an example of a trope of 19th century literature, wherein two characters meet on a train. One tells the other a story, and then as the train rolls to a stop, so does the story. The characters disembark and never meet again, but the story remains. Why did this idea fascinate me? One of my earliest memories is of my father telling me a story. In this story, a wartime landmine washes up on the shore of my father's childhood home. I asked him to tell it to me almost every day, and now the image of the tall, mysterious man who comes to the door and the steps from which my father watched them disarm the mine is burned into my mind. I'm not sure why this captured my imagination so acutely either. Maybe it was the presence of my father, both protagonist and narrator, the center of the narrative and the center of my world. An anxious child, I liked the secure knowledge that at the end of the story, he would be safe. Now, every time I see a house by the sea, I search the shore just for a moment and see a phantom landmine. My perceptions of the world are shaped by the stories I was told. I expect to see reflected in the world all the stories I've ever been told about it. English children grow up with a sense of wonder about their country instilled in them by their early reading. And through this, storytelling, storytelling is deeply ingrained in the fabric of our lives and our psyches. What is it about English children's books which manages to develop the symbiotic nature of the relationship between literature and national identity? Although I grew up in France, I was fed on a rich and relentless diet of English children's fiction. In this part of the world, we live in the shadows of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Over time, books like Narnia, Lord of the Rings and Alice in Wonderland have both shaped and reflected a sense of English identity for children. Then, his dark materials and Harry Potter fulfilled the same role. It is an inexplicable joy to be a child and have an imagination fed on fairy tales, mythology, or illustrated versions of simplified Shakespearean texts. I did also find Teletubbies a particularly formative part of my early culture, if that makes me sound in any way less pretentious. My mother is a writer. She wrote a family memoir called Love Like Salt, and now my whole life is a story written by somebody else. I often don't know how to feel about that. My life, written in her words, changes the way I tell my own story. I've never been able to read more than the first 10 pages of Love Like Salt, and I can't quite work out why. I think it hurts to see my mother's versions of our family story because so many things which I shrouded in the safety of a narrative, she experienced in a painfully real way. Storytelling is just an exercise in therapy. It's recounting experiences and feelings to somebody else as a way of letting go or understanding ourselves. And this, to me, is a moving example of the influence of storytelling, not only on our perceptions of the outside world, but also of our inner one. That private narrative which makes up our soul, self, mind, whatever you want to call it, is a series of stories told and untold. I have always felt that writing that book was a form of therapy for my mother. 
She needed to set out the events, externalize the thoughts which occupied her mind. What was interesting for me was that it had the exact opposite effect on me. It was her story, not mine. I cried trying to read it because I suddenly had to face the parts of my early life which I had changed to a less abrasive narrative, protecting myself from realities by casting myself as a character in a retelling of my story. Therapy is an exercise in storytelling. Reading Love Like Salt, I had to confront the parts of myself which I had edited out of my own life. The copy editor of my personal narrative, I had cut sections from my memories, placed large question marks in red pen next to some episodes, constantly rewording to get a bigger laugh, stretching out elements for dramatic effect, improving sections of myself, it's true, but also inevitably cutting some out. Sometimes, I have to expose the marked-up typescript of my life, with all its ticks, crosses, and question marks, just to remember that it is all there, even if not shown in the version that goes to print. Where in our personal lives, this editing leads to an eventual confrontation of the truth, in the wrong hands, storytelling or editing becomes deception. For instance, in the hands of governments and parts of the media, Denying entrance to refugee children becomes a triumph of job preservation for our country, rather than a death sentence for thousands of innocent, vulnerable people. The nuanced issues of world conflicts are polarized into good and evil, with one's own country always the white knight, rather than an arms dealer driven by greed and a desire for power. Every narrative becomes increasingly twisted and then, in the rush of modern media, media, disappears into the deluge of information which we constantly consume. Even the most dedicated of newsreaders can't read everything all the time, nor can they trace the origins or influences of every news item. If a newspaper has huge investments from oil companies, can their reports on environmental issues really be trusted? Can anybody really be trusted in election season? Storytelling shifts into narrative bending all too easily. It is overwhelming to feel just how easily swayed we all are, because it is easier to believe the thing you want to hear than to spend all that time and effort looking for the truth in mountains of the same thing. Though, as I have mentioned, Governments have a certain penchant for changing their story. There is one narrative they have stuck steadfastly to, and that is a national myth of our history. Over the last year, it has become blindingly obvious to me and many others that this is only one version of the truth. In my GCSE history, which centered entirely around 20th century, where was the education on the many historical accounts of corruption and violence in the police, the extensive evidence of British racism, the Windrush movement, the atrocities carried out in the name of the empire. Why is it that we learn endlessly about racism in 20th century America, but not the Britain of the same era? Some of these things are on the syllabus, it's true, but they remain optional courses and therefore remain largely untaught. As Winston Churchill once said, History will be kind to me, because I intend to write it. So here we are, drawing in at the station. I, the stranger across the compartment, have told you my story, and we will most likely never meet again. Our journey has taken us through the stops of being told stories, being a storyteller, and being part of a story told. Through childhood, the psyche, the personal and national autobiography and how all of these sh things shape us, from Teletubbies to Tolstoy. I do hope that none of you left your baggage unattended. Is storytelling important in school sixth forms, in your opinion, to someone, for example, who is, who is studying maths A-level? I think that we all receive stories in a different way, and, and somebody studying maths A-level probably consciously 
doesn't do that much storytelling or story receiving, but I'm, I don't think that that means that they don't receive them unconsciously anyway. And I think that it's important for everybody um, in all walks of life to have those stories told. Uh, but I don't think it's something you can force on people. I think that it comes naturally in their lives and in their families. I think everybody has their own way of telling and receiving stories. Do you think the telling of stories of people's traumatic pasts are necessary in the building of a better future? I think that the only way to move forward into a better future and to use storytelling in that in, in a way to do that is to tell the traumatic stories of the past. Uh, like in Germany, all school students have to learn about uh, Nazi Germany and the actions of, actions of Germany during the war and it helps them build a better future for themselves and build a more conscious mind about what their country should be doing. I think it's interesting that you use the word traumatic because I think that that does um, create a delineation between whose story we're telling because the atrocities of the war from the um, perspective the oppressor will are important to learn but from the perspective of the person being oppressed is much more difficult so I think it's the sensitivity that we need to be able to properly address these things um, is really important and not a simple thing at all but it's a necessary thing
We would like to begin by congratulating you all on the hard work you have put into the challenging process of writing and preparing for this event. The rigour of your research, construction of your arguments and the considered and passionate delivery of your speech was incredibly impressive, thought-provoking and at times quite moving. As did Koshans and current staff, Dave, Lorcan and I all noted how each of the candidates touched on issues that are also fundamental to SIDCOP values. In particular, the importance of human connection and community, the significance of self-reflection and creativity, and how education must strive to be open-ended and not prescriptive. We have a few words to say about each speech before we go on to announce this year's winner. James. Your opening indirect reference to COVID was a clever mechanism to contextualise the scale of the issue of addiction. This provided a strong introduction to your speech. The combining of well-selected and convincing global facts alongside your own personal experience made a robust point from where to begin your argument. You chose to speak on a weighty and controversial subject, but your decision to close on a positive note outlining solutions for the potential for change gave an inspiring end to your speech. The focus of my judgment will be on the performance and delivery of the speeches. Performance and delivery are an essential part of the marking criteria because if we do not deliver in an engaging way, people will not listen and remember our speeches. For my area of judgment, I will be looking at how speakers answered questions posed to them by members of our audience. Starting with James, I was incredibly impressed by your responses to two very political and societal questions. For your first answer, it was clear that through extensive knowledge and research on the subject, you were able to convey your opinion about the symptomatic appearance of addiction, and not necessarily it being the consequence or product of political, social, or ideological extremes. This was reinforced with your ideas on temporary or pseudo-relational ventures that may cause more harm to society than good civic virtue. You were clearly thinking through this answer as you were responding, which allowed you to come up with not only a good retort, but a solution to the issue as well. Your second question about an elevator pitch with Pretty Patel was just as considered. With what felt like a very impassioned and personal address to Miss Patel resulted in a respectful and heartfelt response to issues that many face in communities today. You spoke clearly, concisely, and answered both questions very well indeed. Thank you, James. Madeline, we enjoyed that you also chose to highlight the imperative human need for connection. You cited some well-selected historical references which gave an interesting basis to your argument. Your focus on the symbiotic relationship between language and culture and how they intrinsically shape each other was really insightful. We liked the moments of humour which peppered the speech and really helped drive the argument forward. Your careful crafting of this argument highlights our need to question and not take for granted the origins of language and how it is used. 